Good morning, saints of First Christian Church. Uh, One of my favorite fruits is watermelon. I mean, the best Jolly Rancher, watermelon. Best blow pop, watermelon. Actually, that's a lie. It's sour apple, and the debate is not even up for, it's not for debate. When my wife brings home a little bit of watermelon, as we call it in our household, our daughters go nuts. Now, in Japan, they have a unique practice of growing watermelons. Due to shipping and storage, they found that watermelons better fit if they are square. They put the watermelon in a heavy-duty casing to shape it. Of course, this has led to other shapes and trying new things, but the process remains the same. The watermelon is being forced into the shape of the casing. They are being conformed to this shape. Now, today... We delve into conforming as human beings in relation to the current age. We're picking up in Romans chapter 12 in our continuation of being Romans 12 disciples, and today we're looking at verse 2. Paul writes, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Many translations render this text in this way. I think that we lose the deeper meaning because of the English language. And do not be conformed to this world is not the best translation. First, conformed is better communicated as to be formed, molded into another pattern. There is the imagery of clay being shaped We see a warning earlier in Romans using the same imagery. Romans 9.20, on the contrary, who are you, foolish person, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Second, we need to grasp world. This is better translated as age or period of time. Though we don't lose the overall meaning as we read world, we're quick to read over the depth of the word that is there. As we read this verse in a more literal translation in the Greek, I want to try to expound upon it so we can read it as though those in the church in Rome would have read it. What is best translated is do not be molded into the image of this age. Now let's stop there. The clash that we're seeing is found in the image of God's creation and the conforming into the image of this age. First, let me start back with the back half of this verse. Do not be molded into the image of this age. Now, last week, we went hard in the paint, basketball reference, in comparing Jesus in contrast to, as Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this age. We looked at the altar of Christ in comparison to the altar of the God of this age in being living sacrifices. In Christ, the altar of Christ, we find new life, healing, and restoration, whereas at the altar of the God of this age, there's destruction and taking of life. Here's why understanding world as period or age When we read age, we understand there's going to be change. When we read world, we subscribe to more constants. When we read the word world, we might consider the sin of our time, but we don't consider the variation of sins over ages. So what's the point? Do not be molded into the image of this age. What is the image of this age? or the previous age, or what potentially in the age to come. And so I'll try not to get too distracted, but here's a 10,000-foot flyover over three generations in addressing the image of God's creation. What I'm, who I'm going to leave out is Generation Alpha. These are, this is the generation born 2010 to 2024. We're not covering them. I'll just leave you with this terrifying fact. This is the first generation of kids that will never know a time when social media didn't exist. They're being raised in a virtual world of virtual realities, virtual escapism, a relative existence. 
In short, what I'm simply saying is get your kids off social media, get them less on technology, and get them out interacting with people, go outside, find things to do. Be social. I've tried to have some conversations, and the vast majority of, gen, uh, of Generation Alpha have a hard time holding conversations. Get them off of social media. Get them into the world. Get them interacting. That's all I got for Gen Alpha. But looking at the image of God, for example, for Generation Z, the, the sin of the age, or the, 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 the time of this age, it's androgyny. They actually think men and women have, are no different in, in, in any facet. The very thought that anything a man can do, a woman can do, and anything a woman can do, a man can do, is simply debunked quickly just looking at biology. A man cannot have a baby. And in fact, if, if a woman were to take a pregnancy test and a man were to take a pregnancy test and they both came out positive, what it tells the woman is, you're pregnant, praise God. What it tells the man is, is you might have prostate cancer. Those are two different results. Why? Biologically, they're different. But as, as this culture has androgenized men and women in the devaluing of the image, now we think men can menstruate, have babies and breastfeed, and women can have a prostate and produce sperm. This is the battleground of the current student in America. The battleground is, whose image are you? They're being confused into rejecting how they were created, the image they were created in, and the function of that creation. Men and women are different, and God made us to be different. Can I please get an amen on that one? Amen. Millennials. It was feminist egalitarianism. I'll, I'll prove this in a simple way. Think of the sitcoms of the 2000s. The woman lead was a wife. She was strong. She was brilliant, well calculated as a character. The man was a, the husband was a bumbling buffoon, which led you to think, how on earth did he get her? Examples, everybody loves Raymond, King of Queens, Malcolm in the Middle, Modern Family, and the list goes on. But now go back to just the 90s, just 10 years before, and look at the sitcoms that were there. You had The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Family Matters, The Wonder Years, Boy Meets World. We have a family unit with a strong male figure, and in some cases more, and a woman who is not emasculating, but is a strong motherly figure. I grew up basically being told, be quiet, women are talking, and the other way shouldn't happen either. Neither should keep quiet just because the other gender is speaking. But in that age, I was being told that I mattered less because I was the problem because I was a male. Now, fortunately, at home, I had a dad who wanted to prepare me for, for, to be on my own, and I had the joy of having a mother who wanted to enjoy the moment at hand. That's the stark contrast I find with Heather and I, as I'm trying to prepare my kids to be on their own, and Heather's embracing the moment that they're in. And I think those are two different things that are good for children, to look at the future and yet embrace the moment that you're in. But this is what we find within bio biology. In Gen X, it was the sexual revolution. So I'm going to try my best to be considerate, but I have already said sperm, so... There was a trick pulled on society, and women got the worst of it. Now, some of you ladies saw right through it, but there were a lot that didn't, and it's just only spiraled. The lie was, is that women should be promiscuous like men. First off, men should not be promiscuous like the stereotypical man. But what happened is it opened the floodgates. Broken men want to sleep around, but the gatekeepers, women, were rightfully being stingy. Good. But then the sexual revolution occurred. We have the nuclear family being attacked, as in 1969, the first state ratified no-fault divorce. Even more with all this promiscuity, abortion was legalized. I mean, we can't have men and women being responsible with the only mechanism that creates human life. 
And so here is the lie. That women are better off acting like the men of the age. And what has this led to? Grown men acting like teenage boys being led solely by their libido, devaluing women and their purity. Women being left high and dry without responsible man to care for children. Women being given the option to terminate a child and then deal with the trauma on their own. And if you honestly think that a woman walks out of an abortion clinic with no trauma, then you are being completely naive. The world says the church only cares about a woman until the baby is born. Well, the clinic only cares about the baby until it's terminated. And then the church is left to pick up the pieces. I've dealt with so many women struggling with forgiveness because of the trauma left by those clinics. There is heavy trauma that comes out of those places. And the world tells you it's just like a simple procedure, but every woman I've spoken to says, I left a piece of me in that clinic. Don't listen to the lie of this age. Don't listen to the lie of the ages. But as we look at this, do you see the process? Going back up, Gen X, devalue women. Encourage destructive traits. Encourage sin. Millennials, devalue men. Emasculate them. Gen Z, what even is a man or woman? You devalue the image and you can reshape it. When we read, do not be molded into the image of this age, do you see how the image changes with each generation? The battleground is different, and yet it's combating the very same thing, the image of God. This is what I think we lose when we read world. The world itself goes through little change in over 100 years. But the ages, the generations, go through dramatic change very quickly. This tells us that Satan is ever-changing his approach to devalue the image of God. And in three generations, we've devalued both men and women to the point that they actually think both men and women are worthless. If there's one goal to achieve as the devil, it is for the image bearer to devalue their image. Their image points them to God, and if one sees their image as meaningless, then the clay will reject the potter. But this is the good news. This is what the Bible tells us. In Genesis chapter 1, first part of verse 26, and the first part of verse 27. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We see in the creation of male and female, only two genders, only two sexes. The triune God, let us create being made in his image. Now this alone can be a series in and of itself. What, what does it mean to be in the image of God? What all does it entail to be in his image? That would be a fantastic study, but let's focus on only two. First, there's an image of community. We've talked about this before. The triune God eternally exists in perfect community. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He creates Adam. And if you recall, he's going through, and he, there's, not a ma there's not a community for him. And so God creates Eve, giving Adam community. The second is an image of creation. In Adam and Eve, we see the image of God in creating. When a man and woman have a child, they have an image bearer of themselves. They bear traits of the parents. Their child bears their image, and this in turn bears the image of God. Furthermore, as God called Jeremiah, he tells Jeremiah a universal truth that we all need to hear. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet over the nations. Now, what does this tell us? Not that we're called to be prophet over the nations. That was Jeremiah's call. But each of us were first formed by God. This tells us that God intentionally, knowingly, premeditatedly created us male and female. He did, not design, he did not sign off on us and realize he shipped the wrong parts. Second, we are known by God. We as human beings will not be found in the pseudo-intellectualism of the age. 
Our identity is found in our author. And if I can really nail this point home, the psalmist writes in Psalm 139, beginning in 13, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made into a secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Do not be molded into the image of this age. Paul writes, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do not be molded into the image of this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be molded, but transform. Notice the contrast. As we've just covered a great, at great length what it means to be molded into the image of this age. Let's not look at this transformation. Now let's look at the transformation that Paul's speaking of. This transformation is the same word used at Jesus' transfiguration in Matthew 17 and in Matthew 9. When he shows his true form, when he shows his glory, Mark records, his garments became radiant and exceedingly white as no launderer on earth can whiten them. In one respect, this transformation we go through is a restoration in one regard, a becoming who we were created to be. Of course, not perfectly, as we will live, as we live in a broken world, and we will have this perfect form when the Lord returns. But in one aspect, we are transformed into who we were supposed to be as Jesus revealed his true nature. Christ produces in us the nature we should have. Only this will be complete in the resurrection. Second, the renewing of your mind. And this is important for us to understand. Paul uses this word renew, and he uses a specific form for a reason. So let let me read one, uh, what, what a scholar has said because he explains it far better than I ever could. This is what they write. And what, off- what offensive measure keeps the believer from being conformed to the present age? The consistent and deliberate renewing of the mind. To make new, Paul uses the noun, renewal, anakinosius, Instead of the verb, anakinao, which would mean to make, which would mean just to make new. This is a combination of new and again. It means to make new again, to make new continuous, to begin to be renewed again and again and again. Paul uses a word here very specifically to communicate the ongoing renewing that is taking place in the life of a believer. And so what Paul's communicating here is an ongoing process, not a one and done. So there's a difference between being made new and continuing to be made new. This is consistent in Paul's teaching as he uses this same term in 2 Corinthians 4.16. Therefore, we do, do not lose heart But though our outer person is decaying, yet the inner person is being renewed day by day. And so let's summarize. Paul builds to our final point today. Therefore, I urge you, he means to plead, to to encourage brothers and sisters in view of the mercy of God. This is the doctrine, the truth, the word of light that he has established through chapters 1 through through 11 in view of God's mercy, in view of his doctrine, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is an ongoing process of a faithful follower of Christ 
always relying upon the completed work of his salvation and surrender to the ongoing sanctification in Christ Jesus. He says, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This worship is only reasonable in light of God's salvation. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do not be molded into the image of this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Instead of being molded into the image of this age, be transformed in the ongoing process of the renewal of your mind. This is not a conforming of the mind, the binding of the mind, but the renewing of the mind. Instead of being conformed to the image of the God of this age, we are being transformed into the image of the living God. Why do we undergo this renewal? Paul writes, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Again, this is made much better by someone else, so let me read it. How exactly is the renewing to take place? What is, what is to fuel the metamorphosis that takes place in the believer's life? Transformation to the image of Christ happens when the renewed mind begins to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. It is the will of God, his standards, his desires, his motives, his values, his practices, which gradually, alluding back to the watermelon, pull the watermelon from its casing into which he or she will be squeezed and conformed. It is a knowledge and practice of the will of God that leads to spiritual growth, maturity in the Christian life. The renewal of someone's mind is when they are removed from the casing of being molded into the image of this age and being able to be made the shape that God has called you to be. How do we know? How do we ask the questions in various ways? For example, how do I know I'm maturing as a follower? How do I know I'm doing the right thing? How do I know I'm doing what God wants me to do? In our sanctification, day by day, being a living sacrifice, being renewed in our lives, we will walk in step with him. His desires become our own. We begin to pray more in the will of God and not in our own. We shift our focus away from ourselves. We value people more and take responsibility for our neighbor. His standards be, become our own. We will not conform to the standard of the age, but unflinching and unchanging will not compromise the truth. We will defend our faith in love and respect, and this we must do, but we will not compromise to the present age. We will be called narrow-minded. We will be called bigots. We will be called racist. We will be called sexist. We will be called every phobic word that is being created today. But I don't know about you, but I at least was taught that a word only hurts if it's true. You can call me a racist all you want, because I'm not. It doesn't offend me. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I have too many people that are meaningful to me that automatically veto that stupid statement. Words only matter if they're true. And yet that's the, that's the, that's the offense of, of the age is just calling you all these words, calling you all this phobic. Is that true of you? Then why have an emotional reaction to it? Why get angry by it when it's not true? Don't, don't fall into that trap. You will be called every name in the book if you're going to stand on the word of God. And it only matters if it's true. But I assume if someone were to come along and say you are a sexist, I assume the Holy Spirit would have already been convicting you and working on you in that. I trust the Holy Spirit more than a gender study major. His values become our own. We begin to see our values shift from what this age says is valuable 
to what God says is valuable. For example, when, when a man changes his profession because he sees in his presence, is, what he sees in his presence at home is more important than his provision for the lives of his children. It's when someone says, you know what? It's better for me to be with my family than to work more and more and more hours. That's a shifting of value. The world tells you you need all this money. But here's what we're not realizing. It's no, your kids need all this time. What's more valuable? Your children having your time, not your children having stuff. You want to change a generation? Give more time to them and less time to the office. That's how we change a generation. But that's also why we've been seeing the generations change the way we have. We can see our maturity and growth because this ongoing renewal, being a living sacrifice, is going to produce measurable and observable change in us. Maturity in Christ is measured in that God's desires, standard, and values become our own. One of the greatest compliments I ever had in the faith was when I was a new Christian, and it was from my brother, and it was meant to be a put-down. I remember speaking with him, and I remember him saying to me, I want my brother back. And at the time, he didn't realize it because he didn't know Christ. But fortunately, praise God, now he does understand what that change means. Because I've seen it in his own life as he surrendered to Christ. Now, I'm not perfect, nor was I in that moment. Yet my brother identified there was something different about his brother. At the time, he did not like it. Look, I've battled with addiction, repented of sin, fought for this renewal from that day till today. And I'm still not perfect. We will wage war against sin until the Lord returns or calls us home. But it is this battle, but it is in a battle that we we have to embrace the suffering of surrendering each and every day, that we renew our mind each and every day, that we refuse to get into that casing again and be conformed to the, the patterns of this age. That's the war that we're against. It's easier to just get into a casing and grow and be shaped into whatever you want. It is difficult to stand before God and go, you chisel away whatever you need to chisel away. You cut away whatever needs to be cut away. And you shape me into the man. You shape me into the woman you've created me to be. That's hard. But to wake up every day and just go with it and conform to the age, there's no challenge there. There's no adventure there. There's no change there. You become a conformist by being a nonconformist. And Paul is warning us, even still to this day, do not conform to the age. But by waging this war, it bears witness to our growth. This also bears witness to something that we see all too often, and this might be tough to hear. But it still needs to be said, and that is, if you claim to be saved by Jesus and your life has not changed, or let me put it this way, you claim to be saved by Jesus and your life has not changed. So what's being said here is the God who took dirt and breathed life into it formed man who healed the lame and the leper, the blind, who casted out demons, who personally rose from the dead, the God who has not been seen in his fullness because the mere sight of his holiness would kill sinners like us. You claim now that he indwells you, but he cannot. He has not changed you. I'm not going to soften this or add any caveats I do want to get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit convict you, but if the God of this universe who created all things enters the life of a sinner, he changes them. And not sometimes. Not most times, every time. And so if we profess to know Jesus and our life is no different, I'm going to leave that there and let the Holy Spirit convict. 
Paul writes, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. See, not only has Christ stepped into creation, died for our sin, rose again, ascended to the Father, he has sent us a helper, the advocate, God the Holy Spirit, the seal of our salvation in Christ, to indwell us that we would be transformed, that we would be renewed in our minds. He has done this that we would know that we would be living in accordance to his desires, his standards, his value, and his will. When we see the lengths that he has gone to save us, as difficult as it is to accept, we are then faced with the lengths he goes to continue to renew us. First Christian Church, what an incredible Savior we have in Christ Jesus. What remarkable lengths he goes to, has gone to, to not only save us, but to renew us, to sanctify us, to shape us. He's doing all the heavy lifting. What a one-sided relationship. And to be honest with you, none of us would have entered into it. Amen? I would, not, I would have given up on me a long time ago. But I remind you again, dear Christian, you will never drink up the grace of God. You will never use up all of his mercy. If you, are fa- if, you, if, you are, if you confess your sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive. Why is he faithful and just? Because of everything he accomplished on the cross. We come to him boldly, not because we're confident in our own performance. We come to him boldly because we're confident in everything he has done. What an incredible Savior we have. Let's pray. God, you are awesome. You are mighty. You are holy. The very fact that you would want to enter into sinners' lives like ours is unbelievable. The fact that you would even want to save us, that you would want to reconcile us is even greater. And then we go so far as that you would want to indwell us, work in us, shape us, renew us. We are just awestruck by the lengths you go to that you would save us and shape us into your image. Not that we would conform, but that that we, we, we would be transformed. I pray, Lord, that as we go into this world, that we would look with compassion and mercy, that as we see those who are struggling, we see those who are suffering under the the pseudo-intellectualism, those who are struggling with transgenderism, those who are struggling with these identities, that we would look upon them with mercy and grace and understand that they are being conformed. They have a casing surrounding them. But if they would cleave to you, you would remove them from that and shape them into who you created them to be. That we would love them enough to tell them the truth. You're being lied to. This world is deceiving you. You're not going to be happier this way. And that your Holy Spirit would break that casing. That our community would find new life in you. Work through us, Father, that we would be bold in this, that we would be merciful and gracious, but love people enough to tell them the casing that you're being molded into is not a casing you're going to find freedom. It is going to destroy you. But I know of the one who will open this up, open this up that you would find new life and new identity, an identity that is found solely in the author. Give us the words to speak when that time comes. Bring the scriptures to mind as we interact, but remind us, Lord, of the love and mercy that we are to give. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.